would you do if you won the lottery? Quit your job? Kick back on a beach? Buy a mansion? Dr. Shirley Press won $56 million in the Florida lottery, and she didn't do any of that. Dr. Press wrote about her experience in a book called Pressing My Luck, A Doctor's Lottery Journey. We're talking to her on today's Dead End Jobs show. I'm Elaine Veets, and today I'm talking with Dr. Shirley Press, who won $56 million in the Florida Lottery. Dr. Press is talking about her memoir, Pressing My Luck, A Doctor's Lottery Journey, on today's Dead End Job Show. Dr. Press, you are a board-certified pediatric emergency physician, and you treat children with serious conditions at Jackson Memorial Hospital for more than 34 years. So what were you doing? When you won the lottery, why did you buy a lottery ticket in the first place? Well, uh, Elaine, at heart, I'm a gambler, and buying lottery tickets is like being a gambler. And from when the lottery started in Florida, I just bought six tickets every week, almost every week. And so it was a routine purchase for me. And where did you buy them? I bought them at the hospital gift shop. And it was a particularly uh, big jackpot. And I, I, it was a day that I uh, wasn't seeing patients. I was doing administrative work and taking a, a course. And uh, I stopped in the gift shop. I had to wait in line because <laughs> there was a lot of people in front of me. And I even debated whether I should get out of the line and just go <laughs> back to work. <laughs> and these are random decisions that come up in your life and have unbelievable uh, effects. So I stayed in line. I listened to everybody talk about the lottery and what they would do with the winnings. But I, I was just, you know, edgy and just uh, anxious and wanting to get back to work. And right before I bought the ticket, I saw in the candy display that they had my favorite candy, which they usually had. And that's the York Peppermint Patty. And that might seem (laughs) insignificant. And everything insignificant leading up to this was there. So I said, I I picked up the candy and I said, this and six quick pick lottery tickets. And you have to purchase it because it's computerized. It's. It's uh, it's nanoseconds. Yeah, the next person, the 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 computer spits out uh, the numbers. Could be in Orlando. Could be in Jacksonville. So the fact that I bought the candy uh, delayed the computer probably in ten seconds, and that, that's what caused me to win. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you didn't use a lucky number. You no. Now, and you owe this fortune of fifty-six million to a peppermint patty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How much of that fifty-six million did you actually get? Did you actually take home? I took home seventeen and a half. Oh. What happened I'm to the rest of it? I'm not <laughs> I didn't. Uh, me neither. <laughs> but it is. It 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 is an eye opener. I I. I took home uh, less than a third because I chose, uh, with, a, with a lawyer's advice, to take a, the um, jackpot as a one-time payout, and you lose 50% of it in, automatically. And that put it down to about $28 million. And then uh, there's no way of, um, I had to pay maximum taxes on it because I, I just had straight salaries. I didn't have any businesses or any tax loopholes, so I paid a straight 39.5% on the uh, rest of the money, which left me with uh, $17 million. and I did it right away. I just, you know, wanted to get it, uh, the tax uh, over with, so I, I hired some financial advisors, and I was left with uh, $17.5 million, and I was very happy. Well, people who win the lottery are supposed to be lucky, but many of them aren't so lucky. They wind up broke. How did you avoid that? Well, the statistics are startling, and I I have some uh, on me because I use them in well, when I uh, do speeches. And uh, in December twelve, uh, December third, two thousand twelve, uh, a reporter named Carl Richards wrote 
for an article for the New York Times and said, on average, 90% of lottery winners go through their winnings in five years or less. And then other reports put that figure at between 55 and 70% of winners go bankrupt. And I was going, I already knew the statistics were bad from rumors. And I've always been smart with money, uh, maybe because I grew up poor. I've always been very conservative, and I said, that is not going to happen to me. I'm going to be smart with the money. Now, you won the lottery on September 10, 2001. Tell us how you felt the next day after winning $56 million. I was horrified. Uh, uh, whether I won the money or not, it, it, it was um, with the nine, with 9-11 happening uh, maybe 12 hours after I found out, I was mortified. I, you know, I just felt like everybody else felt just horrible for the country, for the people that you know, lost, for the people whose lives are lost and their families. And here I'm harboring a secret because I didn't tell I didn't tell anybody. And I felt such mixed emotions because I'm feeling horrible. And for myself, I'm feeling, you know, happy inside. And, and, and I mean, and I felt ha- guilty for even feeling that happy that I won the lottery because of this national tragedy. So I actually kept it to myself, and I didn't tell anybody for a few days. Now, so once I was, I was mortified. Once the word was out that you were, uh, it's it's a big announcement. What happened then, when the whole world knew that you had won the lottery? Well, it's 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 hard to deal with. Um, Florida has what they call sunshine laws, and Sunshine laws, from what I understand, uh, make it so that the state announces where where their money goes. So lottery money is public money. So when I went up to Tallahassee to claim, after I signed all the papers, that's the law. So they made it public immediately with television, radio, and newspaper. And because 9-11 was still on the forefront, and this is Mm -hmm. later, I didn't get as much publicity as I, it's a, a lottery winner usually gets, but that, you know, that was fine with me. But I was immediately bombarded with phone calls, with, uh, you know, everybody knew, which it, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, the, the, it feels like, you know, everybody was just asking me for money immediately, and that has not, never stopped. <laughs> that continues to this day. And uh, I got some, you know, publicity, which I don't feel like I deserve because it's a it's a random uh, event. Now, did your friends, those people who knew you before this, did they did they treat you the same or differently after you won the lottery? Well, most of them, most of our friends uh, treated us the same. Uh, however, there were a few that um, just were very jealous and envious, and those friendships could not survive. That must have hurt. Yes, yes. It made me think about uh, things like, uh, you know, what is a good friend, and and I would be, of course, I would be jealous of a friend that won so much money, too, but I I would consciously say this isn't going to affect our friendship because the person hasn't changed. Their circumstances have, but the person I liked you know, is still there. But, um, and I thought, you know, if, if somebody's parent dies or something tragic, all your friends come out and support you. But when something good happens, it, it, it's very tricky. You know, your friends are happy and they can be, you know, a little jealous. But it, it's a very tricky uh, uh, thing to uh, maneuver. So, um, like I said, most of our friends were happy for us, and uh, some, the, the uh, envy just c- couldn't withstand the friendship. Mm. Now, you, you had some problems after you won. You got at least one threatening phone call. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I was at work, and was spent next week, and uh, uh, one of the unit secretaries said to me, Oh, Dr. Press, you have a call. 
they picked up the phone and they said, is this Dr. Press? And I said, yes. And then the person said, did you win the lottery? And I said, who is this? And he said, I'm going to get you. And I hung up the phone, which I probably should have just was so, more, you know, horrified and scared. And then I told the people at work what happened, and they said, yeah, but what, what, this phone call was just a few seconds, and we, we, were, we just didn't think what to do. We didn't even call security, and I just let it pass. But I was definitely frightened. And I, I should have called security or, or the, you know, the police. But I, I, you know, sometimes you don't do the right thing when you're very scared. Um, did you have any any other scary things that that happened when after you you got this windfall? Yes, I had um, my brakes uh, in the um, hospital parking lot were tampered with. This Ooh. could have this could have been a random event because a lot of cars were broken into. At, at the uh, hospital's parking lot, but um, and the reason I know they were tampered with is because I had just gotten them repaired. And when you know I finally got home, I realized they weren't working, so that was sort of scary. But I, I have a straight ride home, and I guess they were working a little, so um, I, I noticed that uh, they were malfunctioning. And then the, the next day, the, the mechanic said somebody has tampered with your brakes. Mm. So I don't know if the person knew. It was me, or they, you know, could have, it could have been kids just trying to have, you know, you know fun or what it was. Uh, I don't know if it was directed at me because I knew someone whose alternator was missing when they started the car. So it could have been random, but it seemed to have come like a couple of weeks after the lottery win. So I, I don't know. Now, your your parents were both Holocaust survivors, um, and they lost many members of their family in, in that horrible tragedy. How did their experiences affect you when you were growing up? Well, first of all, uh, they, my sister and I were their future. They, my, my father lost his entire family. He lost three brothers and his mother, and his father had died before the war. And my mother had lost two sisters, had one surviving sister, and lost both her parents. So my sister and I were everything to them. And they watched us like a hawk. And they, we, and my sister and I, in turn, because we were the future and everything they had, felt like we had to be perfect. <laughs> and, and it was a lot of pressure, and we couldn't complain because, I mean, if I didn't like, you know, if something say bad happened at school, I mean, it, it it couldn't compare to being, you know, starved and gassed and murdered. And so we didn't, you know, complain about things that probably most kids would complain about. And then, you know, education was stressed. And so both of us studied all the time because... <laughs> Wait, and my parents' education was cut short, so we had to be what they didn't have. So we had to be the best students. We had to be, the, you know, the smartest kids in the class. We just had to do this for them. And, That's hard. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, you know, uh, family was stressed and uh, education and the idea of charity. Even though we were poor, my mother would um, send, we would have hand me down clothes and she would send another batch to Israel for our poorer relatives in Israel. So the idea of tzedakah or charity was stressed when we were growing up also. Did you feel that winning the lottery was some kind of payback for the tragedy that had happened to your parents and their family? Uh, in a sense, my mother always dreamt that she was going to win the lottery. I think it's I, irony, mostly not payback because I don't I don't know if I, I... I do mention payback in my book, but, uh, but um, um, very trivial things. Um, but my mother always thought that, that this would happen to her. And when I called her and told her the, the news, she said, oh, she wasn't astonished. She, she said, oh, it skipped a generation. Oh. <laughs> As if she expected it to happen one day. We all played the, we all played the lottery and I said to her, Mom, this is, this is so uh, extraordinary. 
But she was just like, you know, I doing, you know, like a lot of people. But she had a feeling it was going to happen somehow. Now, you you said that you grew up poor and you went to school on 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 scholarships. So you've experienced tough times. What is it like now to never have to worry about money again or does part of you still worry that you're going to lose it all? I had a recurrent dream that I in the dream I get a phone call and it says, "Oh, Dr. Press, we are so sorry." The lottery was a mistake. Oh. <laughs> I still have these thoughts that I that it, it's a dream and it was a mistake and it didn't happen. And when I'm not thinking like that, I, it is a great relief not to worry about finances. It it it, 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 may, it may be even more of a relief because uh, you know we we struggled as a, a family when I was growing up. Once I became a doctor, then you know things. You know, you know, we're much better, but uh, it, it's a great relief, and uh, it, it, it solves one big problem in life, and that's finances. It doesn't solve health issues and children issues and other things, but it is a relief, definitely a relief. Now, after you won the lottery, everybody always says they're going to continue working, mm-hmm. uh, and Usually within six months, they've quit the job, and some of them have jobs that most of us would be happy to quit. Why did you continue working? I feel, and this is trite and very pedestrian, and I feel that medicine is a calling for me, and I, 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 I did not think about quitting. I thought about you know, going part-time, and in, you know, within a year, I did that, about 10 months later because I had things that I wanted to finish up as, as a full-time uh, doctor. But I didn't think of um, quitting because I, it, I enjoy the work, and I feel like it's me, it's my essence, and I'm doing good in the world. And, um, and so I work right now I work part-time. Now, you, you say often that money is a duty. What do you mean by that? It's a duty to um, help others, and I have tried to help others. I cannot help everyone, and uh, you don't want people to interpret this, uh, oh, she helps everyone, because you can't. You would definitely, you know, there's just too many people to help, but I um, I have a foundation um, that it's, it's small, but I set it up for Holocaust survivors, and I give to charities. I'm on the board of a few charities, and I've given to my family and my mother, and and um, my sister, and so I and I, I've given to some strangers occasionally. I get a lot of letters, and I imagine that celebrities. I'm not putting myself in the same category, but I imagine other people of wealth get these letters all the time. And if they are particularly, you know, heartbreaking, uh, I will, you know, contact the person, and 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 if they, if I can, I have to verify the circumstances because there's a lot of con artists out there i will help people but i cannot help i, I can't help everyone i it's what i could help more than i have <laughs> <laughs> because you, you you have these lofty uh goals but and so i continue to help people and, and to participate in charity work and things like that um were you able to avoid all of the con artists and scammers who came out of the woodwork or did anybody uh take you with one of their stories oh i have i am embarrassed but i am going i have been i thought i was too smart to be fooled but some some con artists befriend you and it seems like uh, i've been fooled a, at least well I, I mean i don't I, I probably do not know how many times but i have been fooled uh at least twice uh, for thousands of dollars, and I would think before that happened, oh, that would not happen to me. I would see through a scheme, but I didn't. And, and so, so how, how much did they? How much did this person get from you? One person got five thousand mm. dollars for. Um, I should have checked it out, and I didn't because I trusted him, and I thought he was a friend, and he was helping me with some other uh, project, and. 
uh, that was uh, $5,000. And, uh, and then another person uh, that I came across had, uh, I think, in retrospect, well, when I realized it, uh, it was a bogus charity. And uh, I was out $6,000. And I didn't, uh, in both cases, I, 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 I trusted my judgment and I trusted the other person. And then later on, I realized I had been conned. Would you say, all in all, that this money, this $17 million, has brought you happiness? That is a very tough question. I, I would say I am happier with it than without it. Uh, my life has had a lot of problems in it. So I wouldn't say that the money has given me financial security, which I'm happy about. But my life in other directions has been, you know, has had many struggles. So I wouldn't say the money's made me happy. I'd say the security, uh, being financially secure, of course, is a relief um, well, your, your husband had serious health problems. I believe he needed a liver transplant. Yes, yes. And, and, and you also had some trouble with your son? Yes, that's ongoing. Mm. Now, um, when you were in Philadelphia and you were uh, and, and the Beatles were coming there, you didn't have $5 for a ticket to the Beatle concert. But in the summer of 1970, you went to Paul McCartney's house. Tell us about that. <laughs> yes, that was I thought was payback. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, as they came to, uh, I think it was 1964, they were playing in Philadelphia, and I lived in Camden, New Jersey, which is right across the river. And $5 at the time, most, not most, but, I mean, the stadium filled up, but a lot of people didn't have $5 for a ticket. And also, I have to, you know, have transportation. That we didn't have that kind of money. In the summer of '70, I have fast forward. I am a college student, and I'm going. I worked all summer, and then for two, two or three weeks, I was going to Europe, like a lot of students our age did. And we we went, we went on an Icelandic air, and landed <laughs> up in Luxembourg, and then took a URI all around, and I wound up in London in a youth hostel. And I, I assume you can shorten this story. And uh, while I was there, uh, these guys come over at night, and they say, we were just in Paul McCartney's house. And they describe everything, how they went into the basement, and they, they were told there was an unlocked door, and uh, they went in, and they searched around, and then they came out. And the rest of us say, sure, we don't, you know, we don't believe you. And they say, yes, yes, it's, un- it's an unlocked door. The lock was broken. So they invited a group of us to come back with them the next day. Well, some people declined because, you know, you're, you're trespassing. So I went back, and I was the lightest person there. So it's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's about 100 pounds. And uh, they hoisted me over the wall. There's no security, no dogs no alarm system. It is the way it was in 1970. And they told me to check the basement door to see if the lock was still unlocked. And I went, and I signaled back, it's unlocked. And so they came over and we went up into his house and I posted some of the photos on my website. And we just looked around the house and we took photos of ourselves in the house as proof that we were there. And then my, I don't think my heart ever raced as fast as it did, uh, I felt like I couldn't breathe because I, <laughs> I knew it was, it was, you know, wrong, but I couldn't miss this opportunity. So I, uh, we, we raced around, took the photos, and then scooted out of there. And it was the, yeah, if you can put most in front of unique, it was the most unique thing and exciting thing I've ever done. Well, very quickly, because we're nearly out of time, tell okay. us where we can buy your book and give us uh, the name of your website. Okay. Uh, my book is available at Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. It's available in a bookstore in Carl Gables called Books and Books. And uh, those are pretty much the outlets of the book. 
And my website is my name, www.shirleypress.com. Well, thank you, Dr. Shirley Press, for telling us about your memoir, Pressing My Luck, A Doctor's Lottery Journey. I'm Elaine Veets, and you're listening to The Dead End Job Show. Thank you, Elaine. 